my question is about the pictures that I see around and the pictures I see in your books, right? What is the significance of including the pictures with the word? That's a very good question. The pictures you see on the wall is real important because if we don't do this, he's going to write them off as white, the way he does all other black men in history. He distorts the pictures and gradually alters the way they look. Next you know, they're real, everybody's real light-skinned, the same way they did the Cleopatra movie and the Moses movie. And people now think Charleston Heston is Moses. And they think that Elizabeth Taylor is really what Cleopatra looked like. And so what I did is, and you happen to be a child that was smart enough to pull the pictures out. 99% of them are so afraid to touch the Bible, even in that state, that they'd never do that. And they start looking at those pictures as they read the Bible and really think that Jesus lived in the village and had a beard and looked like a hippie. They start getting that white Anglo-Saxon hippie image in their mind of what God looks like. And being there telling them that Jesus is God, you know what that means they think they are? When they look in the mirror and they see a black face, they think that they see themselves as the opposite of white. So they teach you that white is the opposite of black, then God is white, then what must black be? The devil. So what I've done is said, like me or not, I'm going to start putting images of black people in the books, regardless of what anybody says, so that the children that read it start to see Moses and Jesus and Abraham and Yusuf and all the people of the scriptures in their real shade and color. The men on the wall are put there so people can remember these great men of our history. Because the white man would love for us to just knock Marcus Garvey and Noble Drew Ali and Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He'd like to lock them out of our history, but he makes sure me and you remember his history. Because if you reach in your pocket and took out a dollar bill, you'd be looking at a part of his history. He made sure we got our face on George and, and Abraham and Jefferson all day. He makes sure of it. So I'm not going to be fool enough myself to say it's not important to me, I'm saying. When I think a physical impression in the mind is important. What a person thinks things are oftentimes has a, a way of affecting the way they react to things. Mm -hmm. I mean, people become, see a white guy with a beard and they saw a little black kid say, there goes Jesus, mommy, walking to the village. And the mother has to say, no, 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 that's a hippie. And that shouldn't be like that. You know, you yeah, okay? it's interesting. It doesn't mean anything, but I agree with you in the sense that there was a certain um, hypnotic uh, brainwashing that we've all been under as a result of, of his nonsense, all right? Spell, it's yeah. got to be sort of cleared, removed, yeah. all right? So when, by whatever means it has to be removed, I'm, I'm all for that, all right? Okay. The question that arises from you saying that now, <clears throat> that's cleared up, but what about, okay, you gave us a picture of the Most High. That oh, means, I knew. I knew, right. the Most High. You gave us a picture of him, that being his title. Now, I, I'm speaking for myself, I don't know if anybody has ever seen them or is him or whatever they want to believe, right. but I have never come in contact with this being. Right. So that would therefore still put me in a belief state. Right. I'm believing that this being I know exists, I have no contact with him. Correct. So my question is how how can you question the existence of this person and You, you know should the question that? the existence because you haven't had the experience. You should. I'm saying don't accept that that's a picture of a new. But listen to this. If Michael Angel can put paint an image of God. You follow that? And then you read a book because Board of Education demands that you do. And he stamps in your mind that image of God. Regardless of what I tell you about the Most High and the Supreme Being. I, I'll just make it clear to you. So you can see what I'm saying. Alright, listen to this. We do this all the time, right? You with me? I want everybody here to say Jehovah. Jehovah. Good. Very strong. Elohim. Elohim. Good. What picture do you see in your mind of a person or persons when you say Elohim? Don't lie. None. Ready? Michael Jordan. What? Do you see somebody in your mind? You see a human being, don't you? Now, when Michael Angelo does the Michael Jordan and we're forced to still do the Elohim. Is that what I'm saying? He is now implanting an image in our mind that regardless of where we are and what we do, we will always reflect back on God as Michelangelo drew it. Why do this here? You see that finger? You seen the picture by the hand where the hands meet? Like I said, that's in my mind. I get this impression now. Watch this. 
God. You start getting the first thing is an older man with a voice like this. I am God. That's what um, 20th Century Fox and most of the movie industries have done. They gave God a voice. And he usually has a British accent, even with movies shot in America. If he's going to speak English, he got to speak the Queen's English, let God speak with a dialect. But whether that was thought out, I don't know. But the reality is, God has a voice. God has a hand. His son, see that? God's son, who is that? Would somebody describe Jesus for me, from what you know in your mind? Yeah, was anybody here a Christian? All y'all Christians? Could you describe Jesus who was on your grandmother's walk? Okay, not now, okay. Well, I'm still a Christian. So, for me, could you describe the picture your grandmother had on the wall? Um, she had, he had like, um, dark brown hair, um, blue eyes, um, pale looking, white robe. Um, he had, like... Was he doing this? Yes. Was yes. he doing this? <laughs> Was he doing this? Yes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, they didn't just give us a face, they also gave us choreography. Right? Yeah, he has certain things he does. And now, when you see the Pope, the Pope knows the choreography. So the Pope goes by and does this. And when he does this, what comes out of mind is we superimpose Jesus Christ over the Pope so we don't look at his, you know, how old and decrepit he's starting to become. We do, you know. And we see in our mind's eye the image that Michelangelo or whomever. Now, the Jehovah's Witness, if you open their books, like the sister said, they have their own drawing of Jesus. Jesus doesn't have shoulder length hair. In the Jehovah's Witness book, he has a nice haircut. I don't know where he gets his hair cut, but he got a nice haircut. He has a Midian, it's called a Midian trim according to the Torah. When you wear your beard like this, it's like much that. That's a specific beard. It represents a specific culture. So it's called a Midian trim as opposed to a the big bear, Jesus wears a Midian trim. So Jesus, according to Joe Witnesses, goes to a barber. Somebody cuts Jesus' hair. Scissors can cut God's hair. You get the drip? God is infallible, but scissors can cut his hair. Did Jesus have to cut his nails in the 33 years he lived? Did Jesus sit down and eat? What's one of the things Jesus ate? What's that? What else? When he got to the upper room, he said, I want some meat. Jesus ate some animal that he created. Jesus had a, a, a lamb, a piece of lamb. Let's say curry. Let's say he's make it. He had a curry lamb. <laughs> you see what they've done? First they give you this God supreme being complex, and then they slowly but surely give you what they call anthropomorphism, where they lay things over it, and it loads, slowly but surely says, God has a hand. God is watching you in God's heart. God spoke through his lips, the face of God. God listened, the hip of God. Moses saw the back of God as Moses was coming up to Mount Sinai. God was turning the corner, he said. <laughs> it says in the Bible, he saw the backside of God. God had a, a rump. You understand what I'm saying? After they've given us the supreme being thing, then they slowly but surely take it apart in our minds. So we're confused. So if I'm a Baptist, I got a concept of God as a Baptist. The Mormons have a different picture of God. And what the Mormons do while they're putting God up there, they're also putting Joseph Smith. While they're putting God there, they got Joseph Smith holding the book doing his hair too. In their church. And his book is the book of the latter day saints, the Mormon Bible. So they give you the Bible, and then you, and they pull you in with that Bible. Now they're getting you in, they're doing this. And then they who? The Muslims do the same thing. The Muslims lure you with the Quran, and as you come and close, this hadith is coming like this. And when you get there, you are learning. The Quran goes in the box, and next thing, everything is about hadith this, Sunni this, Muhammad this, Muhammad this. The importance, sister, of having faces. People say, why do you draw Abraham? I draw everybody who I see. Say, how do I know you see them? You don't, so don't believe me. Right? You don't. Now, Abraham. You get a picture? Isaac, did you get a picture? Moses, did you get a picture? Muhammad, did you get a picture? I'm Michelangelo now, how does it feel? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How does it feel to do that to people? 
for you to take it upon yourself to personify God and angels, because they had angels all over the Catholic Church with wings like this. You know, to personify God, give him characteristics, and nobody questions it. And if I do it, you come to me and say, how you know Abraham looked like that? I was say, like, excuse me, did you go to church and ask them how they know Jesus looked like that? Well, when I do it as a question, everybody else, the Muslims had a spit when I did a picture of Muhammad. They were like, oh my God, the Lord was going to pull him, pull him, pull him. Was, that nigga was bugging. And I was like, so I was supposed to wait until y'all draw an Arab version of Muhammad, and then I got to teach my son, that's Muhammad. But I'm, I'm supposed to wait for you to do that. And no, if I insult you, I'm sorry. No, I ain't doing that. Image is important. It's important for character building. And damn it, if I live in America for 400 years and don't know the images with any good character reflect me, how the hell do you expect my kids to improve? How do you expect them to start feeling good about themselves when all the characters reflected about me is bad? Even Michael Jordan with all the did, there's still this hidden thing about his father's death. Right? Even Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, standing in basketball for me, with all he did, there's still that thing about the Washington Hamas group that he belonged to, it hell Washington on this. Sammy Davis Jr. had an affair, but they had to destroy his character. You understand? They had to destroy George Washington's character. They had to say, oh, George Washington had wooden teeth, traded slaves for liquor, he was an alcoholic. What's with this crap with destroying characters? You know what it does? It leaves room to place in divinity of my choice. Whoever's controlling. You follow that? Here's some good ones for you. Mickey Mouse. How many people know what Mickey Mouse looks like? If you are under 35 years old, you don't know what Mickey Mouse looks like. You know the new Mickey Mouse. When we was kids, there was a different Mickey Mouse. The one that got Disney World is not Mickey Mouse. That's a new guy. Who knows Betty Boop? Tell me about Popeye. The one they put in the movie, <laughs> is not the original Popeye and Olive Oil and Pluto. And who is the one who said, for a burger today, I'll gladly pay you tomorrow. <laughs> Look what they did to Mr. Magoo. They've taken Mr. Magoo from a cartoon character and made him a person. Now when I say Mr. Magoo, I no longer see the cartoon. When I say Betty Boo, I know when I say Popeye, when I say Batman, when I say Superman, I see Christopher Reeve. And there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with taking the prime order, the images of the people that only look like one race of people. That's wrong in a world where there's so much racial tension. That's wrong and it's not even logical because it breeds danger. No, first Bart had afros because Bart Simpson was invented by a Negro. Did y'all know that? Yeah. And then he was brought out. Why? Why was it necessary to change him? Why couldn't he just leave the character? But I miss Michael Jackson. He cut off his nose. Minnie Rippleton. Richard Pryor. Drugs. <laughs> Bill, go ahead. Bill Cosby, his son. Nat King Cole died because he came down south. He had throat cancer. Came out the one of my favorite artists came out the hospital because they wanted him to do a show down south. And when he got on the stage, clan members threw bottles at him, knocked him unconscious. He went back in the hospital and the doctor said, I can get this, you can get his state. He could have lived, but he was heartbroken and didn't want to live. Go check the story, he touched a very sensitive one there. He killed himself, that's how hurt he was. Do you know that people down south didn't like Elvis Presley? Did you know that? Elvis Presley was a nigger. He moved too much, they said, too much hip acting, too much of this stuff. And they did not like him until he was dead. That's another thing. They eulogize you when you're dead. Talk about all the good things you did 
and how nice you were. Well, even President Kennedy, after he was dead. Oh, he was having an affair with Marilyn Monroe. He was hanged up. With, uh, his brother Bobby was involved with the mafia. Marcus Garvey. What did they do to him? Does anybody know what they did to Marcus Garvey? Huh? They murdered him. Why? What's the image? Are you guys, when y'all have your first child, are you going to put Marcus Garvey's picture up on the wall and tell people, tell your kids, this is Marcus Garvey. He's a great man. Huh? Are you going to put Alice Selassie up on the wall? Why not? He's a lion of Judah. That's what does. You're Jamaican. You see how we think? You see what I just did? That was it right there. We think all Jamaicans are Rastafari. All Jamaicans acknowledge that. Like, that's part of the, I know it's not true. But the bottom line is that's what we believe because that's what's been taught to us. In fact, when we see a black person who says they're Muslim, the first thing that comes to our mind is, are you a black Muslim? Right? If someone knocks on your door on Sunday morning with a suit on and say, no, I ain't interested in Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I'm not a Jehovah's, I'm your uncle. <laughs> what have they done to our minds? You've got to go into why it's important to become Michelangelo in this day and time for everybody to rid this subliminal seduction. I can't. That's the thing I'm telling you. That's what I can't do. That's the sad. I can't erase what Michelangelo did. But I can I can get there before the before the Mohammedans do. See the Mohammedans set out to come to America to convert Americans to Islam. I know, because I'm one of them who came here as an Arab to convert people. They brought themselves to Islam. And part of that plan, right, was to implant in their mind Arab out of the Arab side of you. And that would remove the Americanism out of you and make it easy for you not to care about where you're standing when I'm throwing bombs at your ass. You follow? That's all part of the Arab plan. And that's why they wanted to kill me when I put out a picture of Muhammad. Because they didn't get a chance to put their image in their heads first. I beat them to it. And I said, this is what Muhammad looked like. And I said, Muhammad is not no, he's not a, I said, he's not a what? Nigger, you want to say? <laughs> I thought there was no racism in Islam. Well, it doesn't make a difference. And he said, well, nobody knows what Muhammad looks like. And I said, I do. He said, how do you know? He came to me. Now, if they say no, it means he's dead. <laughs> he came to me and he spoke to me and said, I want my picture known. I want people to know what I look like. I don't want people to mix it up. But this is what I'm doing right now. Christians, is Jesus dead or alive, according to them? He's alive, according to Christians, sitting on the right-hand side of God in heaven, and he visits preachers periodically and talks to their heart. Well, Jesus visited me and talked to me and told me to draw a picture of him. So, because he said, the picture they got out of me is not me. A doc, I know you could draw. I want you to draw the picture. He stood down, he sat down in the chair, he did like this. <laughs> and I took my pen and I went, hold still. <laughs> After about two hours, Jesus got tired and actually couldn't sit down. Threw me off before. <laughs> God got tired. So when I finished drawing him, I asked him, is this okay? He looked at it and said, no, fix the nose. So I fixed the nose. And I said, is that okay? He said, all right, let's Who denies God is sitting up there? Come on. I'm going to get y'all. Come on, let me say, y'all are hypocrites. Because y'all believe God is omnipresent. And the moment I think he's over there, y'all say he ain't. You see, you believe he's omnipresent. You believe God to be everywhere. But just because I'm saying he's over there, now he's not. But you know what? All over the world, people go to places like South America because someone says there's a statue of Mary crying. And people pack up their bags and run to South America and look and see condensation and fall down and start praying because they feel that God's mother, who, who didn't believe in him, had confined herself to the one statue in this one town, this one village, and they sit out there and have candles, they go, oh, Jesus, love. Jesus ain't here, Mary's here, not Jesus. They, they feed about, and they really believe that something took place there. Now, I say, God's up on that thing up there. He waved to me. Y'all don't see him wave? You know why y'all don't see him wave? I'm going to tell you why. Because y'all don't have him in your heart. 
See? Is this the game? See, in order for you to have seen him wave, you would have to have been saved. You would have to have had him in you. See, you would have to have been down inside your heart. You would have had to move around you and up inside you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord Jesus. You ain't got the Holy Ghost. So you can't see him. But I, oh, I. I'm in touch with God. You see the game? And we can't get under it beating ourselves up. We got to get from under that crap. God is sitting up there. Hey, he's sitting right up there. That's it. Do you see him? Is he there? Where isn't he? Where isn't God? Then God is up there. And God is here and there and there and there and there and there and there. That's where God is at. So there's no place where God isn't. The people that bother me are the people that are trying to put God someplace. Our Father, who art in heaven. God can't fit inside heaven. God has a throne. God don't have a seat. Well, that's a metaphor towards heaven. God can't be in heaven. God can't be in and be God. <laughs> you understand that? And that's the, that is a subliminal attack on your conscious and your subconscious that makes you misinterpret God as the being that exists. The love force, the harmony, the beauty, the concern, that's God. Now, where is God? The question should be, where isn't God? Not where is God, because God can't be any place. God can't be any person. God can't be anything. But God can be. <laughs> you follow that? And all of us are in God. Now, is God in us? <laughs> Only if we are in God. Otherwise, to separate him, take a portion of stuff of inside here, is putting him in a person, a place, and a thing. That's what they don't want us to grasp. They want to give us the supreme being concept, and when we start to question, they make it his son, so we can have a focal point. And then that son is an image they want to put in our mind, and then that relates to the people that look like the image. And it's all over. You follow? If I come along and say Jesus is black, I'm a racist. That's the wrong thing to say. That's the wrong thing to do. Now let me answer the question. Are these the faces of the real people? Yes. Yes, that's it. Now, when you ask me how can I prove it, I can't. I don't have to. You understand? The burden of proof is on you to bring me their real faces if that's not them. See, I beat you to the punch. You follow what I'm saying? I don't have to prove that that's not Abraham. You have to bring me the picture of their Abraham. And then show me, and then, then tell me, now I'm going to ask you. No, this is Abraham. <laughs> You're going to say, no, this is Abraham. No, this is Abraham. This is Abraham. This is Abraham. That's it. See, that's what happened with the Mormon, the Jehovah Witness, and the Baptist. They all got a different Jesus. Will the real Jesus please stand up? So all of y'all, you have to get rid of all their images. And the only way to make people get rid of all the images is to come out with images that they don't like to see. See, as long as you're doing it to me, it's cool. But when I do it back to you, how does it feel? You know what I'm saying? When I say, no, Columbus didn't discover America, Rodney did. <laughs> Who's Rodney? See, Rodney sailed before Columbus. He came from Africa. He sailed around this way. It was Rodney and Umfufu and, and, well, and Mustafa. Yeah, and Mustafa. They, they, they came here first. They were here. They were, when Columbus came, they were the ones that said, how you doing, Columbus? Prove it's not true. You, you, 
You understand? The burden of proof. People will have to, what? What will they have to do? They'll have to start presenting the facts when you put them before it. If you don't ever put anything up, they'll tell us any damn thing. But when you start saying, prove it, prove Jesus existed, prove it. What have you found out, Luapians? When you ask people to prove that a man named Jesus existed, give me proof. What have they done? They can't prove it. Say, show me something that the rabbis from any other village, anybody around Jerusalem, anything, anywhere where anybody can prove it. They can't do it. And they get mad at you. Because they never were asked questions like this before. That's what Daniel said in Daniel 7. In the end time, knowledge will become abundant. Then wisdom is going to come out of the mouth of babes. Forget the Pharisees and the reverence of the smart ass. It's going to be the meat that shall dumb found. Um, are you Matizadik? Yes, I am. You are the angel Michael. Yes, I am. I, I spoke with an angel today. Um, so what? All, of, all of you are angels who have fallen from grace. Remember, and we are only sent to testify unto you about the coming of the Messiah and those who listen and accept him into their lives they will be transformed back into an angelic state again all of you are angels and all of you are sons of God who have fallen from grace our job is merely to prepare you to dress you up like a bride and prepare you for a groom for the great wedding what they call Crystal City will descend out of heaven in New Jerusalem and you will enter back in in the presence of the Heavenly Father and therein cry no more, suffer no more, feel no more hunger. All the attributes that the devil has subject you to on earth will be removed from you when you enter back into the sacred city. All of you are angels. So when you say I'm speaking to an angel, so of I. This happened to John when tutoring him through the books of Revelation and he decided to fall and prostrate and was told, get up because I am your fellow servant. You understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in Islam, is there a uh, marriage ceremony or are people just um, married if they are... Um, no, there's a very, strict, the very strict marriage ceremony in Islam mm -hmm. and Nikah. The actual dowry has to be paid there has to be contracts drawn up, there has to be family meetings and discussions for genetics. It gets very intense because in Islam, we don't marry just because the person is pretty. We marry by genetics as well. We make sure that there's no disease in the father's blood. If my daughter is to marry, I want to make sure that there's no disease in the father's blood or his grandfather's blood so we inherit it. And this may sound bad, but you keep your bloodline pure by knowing who your children marry. And that's very, very, very important for you women is not to marry dumb men because they're cute. You better start thinking about what you marry because what you marry will determine what the intellect of your children are. It is time for us to start breeding mentally. We have stopped breeding mentally. We started breeding physically. People said he has curly hair or light eyes or light skin. So I'm going to have a baby by him because I have light skin, curly hair kids. Those days are over. It is now time for you people to start breeding mentally because the higher the mental capacity, the easier it is for extraterrestrials to communicate with you. People on a low mental capacity, it's very difficult to penetrate that block, that ignorance. But people who are more sensitive spiritually, because they were bred properly, it makes it easier when extraterrestrials are trying to communicate. Because messiahship or Christ is a nature that you all must succumb to. There's great masters or beings called Elohim in the beginning of Genesis. When they say in the beginning was the word, they use the word Elohim. Elohim is a Hebrew word, which is Elo in a plural. These Elohim are which they refer to as the we or the Lord of hosts, the angelic beings, they are overseeing, they come into your plane at different periods of time to interfere with what man is doing to try to coerce him. Those of you who accept the teachings into themselves will be transformed back into, again, angelic beings, and you will witness the heavens. You'll see angelic beings, and you'll travel other galaxies. Those of you that can make that height.